A very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us today at our webinar titled 10 Years On, Enhancing Financial Re Resilience of SG Women, Evidence from a Longitudinal Study. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping uh, matters to go through. Um, the webinar sound and video quality is dependent on the internet connection. A 4G mobile or Wi-Fi connection and Earthnet cable connection is recommended. In the event of any internet issues arising, please do bear with us. In the event, event of any disconnection, you can use the link in your confirmation email or on our website, uh, which is uh, flashed right now on your screen, to log in. If you get disconnected from the webinar, do use the same link from the confirmation email to join back in. The webinar will be recorded live and will be made available on our web website. At the bottom of your screen, uh, there is a chat function and a Q&A feature. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them in the Q&A feature or the chat box respectively. We will try our best to address all your questions during the panel discussion, so please feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar. In 2005, South Foundation jointly commissioned a study with the uh, Association of Women for Action and Research on the status of older women in Singapore, highlighting key disparities between men and women at older ages, pointing towards the need for gender mainstreaming in aging policy. Sao Foundation's perspective is that aging is fundamentally a gender issue because of the feminization of aging and the predominance of women among the older population. Furthermore, on a more personal note, um, Working towards the well-being of older women is a mandate specified by our founder, Madam Sao Ung Yushun. As an elderly woman herself, uh, Madam Sao felt deeply that modern society is particularly unkind to older women and that after years of caregiving and contribution, they may be left disempowered in poverty and uncared for in old age. The findings of the study then have shown some answers and raised more questions about the financial situation of older women in Singapore. But what was startling then was the widening gap in CPF savings between men and women from 1980 to 2000, despite the fact that women are generally getting better educated. The report identified women aged 14 and above as the most vulnerable, vulnerable group. With below secondary education, they are either not likely to have been in the workforce at all, and if they are in the workforce, are the most likely to be adversely affected by both cyclical and structural downturns. That was actually the main reason why the City South Foundation Financial Education Program for Women was developed and launched in 2007. Ten years on, with City Foundation support, we, con we commissioned this impact study. In this 90-minute webinar, Dr. Joanne Young, a senior economist at the University of Southern California Center for Economic and Social Research, will present the overall findings of a mixed methods, longer term assessment of the program and its impact on participants. In conjunction with the year of celebrating SG Women this year, we invited three other women, Ms. Mariam Jafar, Member of Parliament for Sambawang GRC for Woodlands, Ms. Ginarita Ng, South City South Foundation alumni, and financial blogger, Ms. Dawn Sher, to join Dr. Ung, Dr. Jung in a panel discussion, which I will moderate. Together with all of you, we will discuss how women across all age groups need to enhance their financial resilience to achieve financial security in the light of longer life expectancy of women in Singapore. This afternoon, we're also very much privileged to be joined by our guest of honor, Mrs. Josephine Thio, Minister for Manpower and Second Minister for Home Affairs, who will deliver the welcome remarks. Mrs. Josephine Thio was appointed Minister for Manpower and concurrently the second Minister for Home Affairs on May 1, 2018. She is also a member of the National Jobs Council and the Future Economy Council. Without further ado, let us uh, hear and listen to uh, the welcome remarks of our guest of honor, Mrs. Josephine Thio. Please. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to join you at this webinar. A thank you to Dr. Marianne Sao, Chairperson of the Sao Foundation, and uh, Ms. Susanna Harding, as well as your team at the International Longevity Center Singapore for organizing this webinar and for inviting me. 
I also want to make a special shout out uh, to the other panelists, especially my parliamentary colleague, uh, Ms. Mariam Jafar. This year, I think we all recognize is a special one for all of us, as Singapore has dedicated 2021 as the year of celebrating SG women. It is a call on all Singaporeans, both women as well as men, to review the progress of women in Singapore with a view to sustaining our development. Specifically, in terms of financial resilience, which is the topic for today, there are a few key aspects. And the first has to do with how we support women through work. The female employment rate has actually been rising steadily in Singapore. We just need to look at the development over the last decade, just a span of 10 years. Uh, in 2010, the female employment rate was 68.4. That means about two in three women were in the workforce. But when we fast forward just 10 years to 2020, it has gone up to 76.6%. And what that means is that more than three in four women are in the workforce. I think we can all agree that there are still challenges. For example, within families, there is still a tendency for women to carry a larger share of the household and caregiving responsibilities. Also, older women are overrepresented in some sectors or jobs that pay lower wages. So many of the parenthood and caregiving support measures that we have put in place benefit women who are juggling multiple roles. So too are schemes like workfare and silver support, as well as the raising of the retirement age and the re-employment age. So for example, around two thirds of silver support recipients are women. Our policies and schemes have also evolved over the years to encourage support from employers, the community, as well as loved ones. First, the government has lowered the minimum threshold sum required for CPF members to transfer their CPF savings to their spouses, parents, and grandparents. And women are very often on the receiving end of such transfers. Second, we incentivize cash top-ups to CPF accounts, including those of caregivers and homemakers with tax relief through the Retirement Sum Topping Up Scheme, RSTU. In 2020 alone, a single year alone, $3 billion in top-ups were made with 27% more members topping up for their parents, including their mothers in 2020 compared to 2019. So there has been an uptick. We also launched the Matched Retirement Savings Scheme or MRSS this year to further bolster the retirement nest egg of those who may have less to retire on. And women sometimes are in that situation because they left work in order to care for their families. So MRSS, in some sense, is to help address these kinds of situations too. Uh, some of you present would already know that this idea of the Match Retirement Savings Scheme originated from early discussions between the South Foundation and the government to study how to better support older women. So I want to thank South Foundation for highlighting this need and for advocating on behalf of the women. And now we have a scheme to realize the goal that you had set out earlier. The MRSS will match every dollar of cash top up made to the retirement account of eligible members up to an annual cap of $600 for five years from 2021 to 2025. In other words, there is about $3,000 worth of uh, matching grants that can be enjoyed by the recipients. Among the economically inactive CPF members, including caregivers, MRSS is expected to benefit two and a half times as many women as men. Not that the men are excluded from this, I should 
add. But because of the way the scheme is designed, the way in which it is set up, it is far more likely for women to benefit from it. And with Mother's Day just around the corner, I would like to encourage you to consider gifting top-ups to the mothers around you, if you can, and to share this awareness with your friends and family, and also to encourage them to do so. The South Foundation and City Foundation have been doing good work on this front since 2008, when the City South program was first launched to educate women on financial literacy. Knowledge is power. And this program aims to empower women to take charge of our finances so that we can become more financially resilient as we grow older. I had the pleasure of meeting graduates of the programs several years ago. I still remember that occasion vividly and very fondly. I recall hearing all of the participants share about the program and how it was making a positive impact in their lives. It was not just knowledge about financial literacy, but it was the sense of camaraderie that they experienced through this program, building up a very valuable support network of peers that were encouraging each other to strengthen their financial literacy as well as resilience. I think we can also agree that financial literacy is a life skill everyone should have so that we can manage whatever money we have well and to make sound financial decisions for ourselves and for our families. And women in particular make quite a lot of the financial decisions at home. So this is even more empowering than just for the women alone. It is, I think, also the first step towards building financial resilience and being prepared for retirement, especially as Singaporeans are living longer. Through providing a supportive environment for our women, we can all empower them to fulfill their career aspirations concurrently with family commitments. It goes without saying that we need the collective participation of the individuals, the families, organizations like yourselves, the community to co-create and implement solutions to further the progress of women in our society. So on that note, let me thank you once again for inviting me. I wish everyone fruitful discussions for the rest of the webinar. And I also want to take this opportunity to wish you a great weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Uh, Josephine Thio. Um, I'd like to ask uh, all the panelists to turn on your camera and uh, to have a chance to have a uh, photo with the minister for now. Uh, Keith, could you help us? Hello, please look towards the camera and smile. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, maybe one more photo. <laughs> one, two, three. Great, the photo is taken. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Tio. Um, and uh, uh, I do hope you can continue the engagement to, with yourself and your team and uh, really for gracing us and inspiring us with your welcome remarks and all the support that you have been given extending to South Foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you I very much, you Susanna. To give after this, so uh, we really thank you for your support. Thank you. Um, we will now hear from uh, Associate Professor Joan Jung. Um, Senior Economist uh, and Director, Center for Economic and Social Research, University of Southern California. Joanne will be presenting the overall findings of a mixed methods, longer term assessment of our financial literacy program. Associate Professor jo Joanne Young is an applied economist working at the intersection of behavioral economics and health and financial decision making for the well being of vulnerable populations. Dr. Jung's primary appointment is senior economist at the USC, where she directs the offices of the USC Center for Economic and Social Research, both in Singapore and Washington, DC, and is a principal member of the USC Behavioral Economics Studio. Joanne, please. 
Thank you very much, Susanna. I'm actually delighted to be here. Uh, just give me a second to share my screen. I want to also say that this work is joint with uh, colleagues of ours at uh, Research for Impact Singapore, which is our social impact consultancy right here, as well as our colleagues at Black Box Research who supported us in the deployment of the survey that we have. Um, again, thank you very much everyone for this opportunity to share the results of what I think is not just an exciting evaluation for the SAO Foundation, but really a landmark study for financial literacy and financial education worldwide. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Um, just to give all of us a little bit of background, I know Minister has already alluded to this, um, but uh, the City South Foundation Education Program is really a landmark development. It was put together in April 2008 to address the financial capability of women in the age of 40 plus who are in the lower income segments of Singapore. Now, this program was one of the first of its kind to be launched in Southeast Asia. It was a joint initiative at the time between the City Foundation and the SAO Foundation. And it has been rolled out nationwide with a very high level of acceptability in Singapore and is now a program that has been replicated across Southeast Asia. What's very unique about this particular program is that it's both evidence-driven and community-driven. So it is a program that both draws on best practice internationally a deep understanding of what makes learning effective for older women and local contextualization for Singapore. When they were first designing this program, it took off with a needs assessment based on a series of local focus groups. And the curriculum design was informed by best practice internationally, as well as an understanding of what it takes to make decisions in Singapore. Ultimately, the way they chose to run this program was weekly sessions of interactive workshops rather than a lecture series or a classroom based program. And these workshops were filled with activities and discussions that were led by two program trainers for a group of 20 to 25 participants. And this curriculum focused critically both on financial knowledge as well as social empowerment. So while we were teaching women about personal finance, about areas related to savings, debts, investments and insurance, we were also teaching women about the social capability that they would need to engage with finance. And so part of what took place during these sessions was not just teaching the facts of finance, but teaching women techniques to discuss and to negotiate the roles and dynamics within their families, role play conversations that they might have with family members, um, and also to think about the types of conversations and power dynamics that they might have also in transacting outside the home. So for example, to role play discussions with financial institutions and financial advisors, all with the goal of developing the social and financial capability together to be prepared for old age. The other very important part of this was that this was not a theoretical curriculum. It included very practical suggestions to activate behavior change and to help women become more financially independent. As part of this program, all participants would discuss and put together an individual financial plan, a very basic financial plan that they would sign a pledge for at the end of the program. Now, again, as part of the commitment to evidence generation, the South Foundation actually commits, com, uh, co, uh, at the time, committed to a pre-post evaluation. This was undertaken by Trina Becker in 2013. And so every participant that enrolled in the program did a baseline survey as well as a follow-up survey. And what we found was that in Singapore at the time in 2013, um, in 2013, most individuals who had been part of this program reported that they already went in with some savings. And so to some respect, this tells us that our social and financial safety nets do work. People have some savings to their name. However, their knowledge and engagement with that savings was very limited. So more than three quarters of the women, even though they had something to their name, were not actually very highly aware of what to do with their own family finances. And what the initial evaluation revealed is that there were very strong immediate effects on financial attitudes and self-reported behaviors, including planning. So the savings rates uh, for people who were enrolled in the program after going through it rose to 94%, although borrowing didn't change very much during this period. Um, the actual accumulation rate went up significantly, and that's by 20 points, which that's amazing. And more importantly, the number of people who knew what financial products would be suitable for them went drastically up from under 40% to almost 80%. And those who reported having a clear plan because of the way that the program was run, ran from less than half to almost 90%. 
Most importantly, when we want to think about resilience, which is a theme that cuts across all our programs today, what we see is that the number of people who reported feeling prepared in case of an unexpected crisis went up from 50% to 80%. And the number of people who felt empowered facing their financial futures almost doubled from 46% to 89%. And those are stunning results for almost any financial literacy program around the world. But these were results that were very short term in nature. And one of the questions that the South Foundation wanted to know, which is a question I think that is a very challenging question, um, is to really ask themselves, to what extent are these effects sustained? What do we know 10 years after the fact, when we are uh, 10 years after the program was first incepted or more, how are these effects sustained in the population that we went through? We went through a significant amount of change since then and participants have gone through a significant amount of life course. Have we really adequately prepared women for old age? So firstly, from a knowledge perspective, have participants gained knowledge or have they forgotten everything? Or has this become the foundation for expansion of new financial skills? Secondly, have we seen that the program has changed people's behaviors? So perhaps you know, we knew something, but have people actually gone on to implement some of those changes in their everyday lives? And last but not least, can we say something about how the program has influenced outcomes? So have there been increases in financial well-being, independence, self-efficacy and empowerment? And have we seen, for example, that women are more resilient? So to the extent that we now live, I think we all know, in a highly uncertain world, have these women truly been prepared to face those uncertainties? Again, very challenging questions to answer. And what we managed to do with the South Foundation is sit down and plan an evaluation strategy that we thought would help to address some of these questions in a meaningful way. And so what we did was first undertake a desk review of the evaluation results initially. And then we commenced a mixed method study. And what this means is that we took two parts of the study. One was a qualitative study of selected past beneficiaries. So we called back people who had participated in the program and we discussed with them in focus group settings, both in Chinese and in English, what their perceptions of the program and to derive some of their narratives about what they had done since then and how this program had affected their trajectories since in the long period since they had been together. And so this was a very in-depth qualitative study of the trajectories of these women and their experience of the program. And the second piece of this is a quantitative follow-up using a phone-based survey. And so of the participants that were uh, enrolled in the program, we actually went back to the initial list and we called them up. And of the initial group of participants with the phone-based survey, again, undertaken by Black Box Research, we were able to reach 200 participants. We actually replicated a number of the outcomes that were asked at the initial evaluation stage. And then we asked some new questions, including questions about how they were coping under COVID-19. Because we did not have the ability, and some of you who follow social science research today will have the idea that it's possible to do, for example, randomized control trials in the social service sector. Because we didn't have the ability to follow a comparison group longitudinally, what we did was try to figure out if we could find a comparison group from the population today to try to understand what, the, what their financial outcomes today could tell us. And the reason is that a purely pre-post study doesn't tell us very much about the benefits to women in a causal way, simply because there's been so much change over time that teasing out the effect of the program itself is very challenging. And so what we did was we recruited a comparison group from a companion program also run by the South Foundation that targets very similar demographic participants. And this is their SCOPE program, which we can talk about another day, which is also a fantastic program. And what SCOPE does is it's primarily a health literacy program. Although it targets the same types of participants, it doesn't discuss financial information. What we did was we called up individuals from the SCOPE program, and then what we, we performed a statistical matching analysis, where what we did was we took age, income, and education, and matched the two groups, the South Foundation group from the City Financial Application Program and the SCOPE participants to create a match comparison group that would look very similar in terms of demographics and current income. And then we compared the outcomes between these two. And any difference between these two outcomes, we could conceivably attribute to their exposure to the financial education program rather than the health program. And I think that the combination of both the deep narrative analysis and our quantitative survey results were very strongly corresponding and led to a very rich set of insights. And I'm gonna give you a very brief overview here, but I'll be very happy to talk about them in more detail during the discussion. Um, this slide, I'm not going to spend too much on. It just gives you a little bit of a snapshot of the South Foundation um, 
the City South Foundation um, program participants. And what you can see again is the demographic groups, um, the level of education that we're looking at. For the most part, individuals here were in this had secondary education, although there was a very small number of them that had university education. And as you can see, a number of these people are now retired. And if they're not retired, very few of them are in the income bracket above 14%. Now these again, these traits were matched to our participants from the comparison group. So they look very similar on all of these three dimensions. So what did we learn from our exercise? The first thing that we learned was that when we looked at the understanding of participants, that participants actually retained a very strong understanding of the purpose of the program and the key themes. Now, I want to be very honest here. When we did call up some of these participants, they would say, oh, we don't remember the program. And then when we did tell them about the program, they say, oh, that program. So they might not have remembered the name of the program, but with some prompting, everyone remembered the program itself and the content of the program. And when we asked them about the financial knowledge, it turns out that, I'll show you some evidence later, that they retained good understanding of the conceptual knowledge and very high continuing satisfaction. I won't show you the satisfaction percentages uh, because uniformly there was satisfaction of over 80% on all dimensions of the program from the level of teaching to the quality of the teachers. And the survey also shows that participants outperformed on the financial literacy concepts that were taught during the program. What was more important actually for us were the insights that we gained from the qualitative research, because what the qualitative research told us was that in addition to the teaching that went on during the program, participants really benefit from the peer learning during the program. And so what they benefited from was the discussion that they had with one another and the motivational support. Participants very frequently mentioned how much they enjoyed the group environment during the class. And in fact, a fair number of people told us is that one key thing that happened for them was the fact that they formed a social group that they could talk about and that this social group actually for many of them persisted until today through whatsapp or chat groups and that they were still meeting they were still having uh, conversations with their coaches and facilitators and more importantly this was a group with whom they could talk about money frankly and openly now, it was the case that many of them had very strong social groups elsewhere, but this was a group that had been formed to talk from the beginning very frankly about issues that were taboo in other settings, and that this resulted in a community that they could go to again and again to discuss finance with no, without being judged and without any prior, uh, without people having prior um, preconceptions. What you can see here is one example here. When we ask people, for example, this is a very standard financial literacy question that is fielded um, across both uh, Singapore and the rest of the world. And this question here is about compound interest. It's the, one of the same questions that's also used to evaluate money sense. And what you can see here is the response of women in the city style group and women in the match comparison group to this question, which is that if you put money in the bank and you have $100 and the bank gives you interest of 5%, after 10 years, how much would you have left? And what you can see here is that uh, that the city style comparison, the city style group does significantly better um, than the than the group, but also that at the end of the day, they're also significantly less likely to say I don't know. So they actually perform significantly better on these metrics, and they're also much less likely to feel that not not to guess wrongly, but really to have some concrete knowledge. Now they don't have, um, in terms of significant differences, there was no significant difference in their understanding of inflation or diversification. But again, they were much less likely to say, I don't know. I put the umbrella up there in the corner because from our qualitative research, what we found is that women also said that even though they didn't remember the specifics or the facts, that they remembered the concept. For example, one woman said very specifically, I don't remember the calculation. But I do remember that our coach told us insurance is like an umbrella. You buy it when it's a sunny day, and if it rains, you're protected. But if not, too bad, you've already spent that money, but you had that protection just in case. And so that visible metaphor for her remained very salient, even though, as she said, I don't know how to do the calculations. Lah. But that fundamental conceptual knowledge and that strong metaphor remained for her even 10 years later. Which behaviors were affected for our population? What we found is that the strongest impact for women coming out of this program were reported in money management and budgeting and better understanding of their own investing and savings. Again, if you remember, most women went into this program with a high level of savings. The question is what happens to their engagement with those savings and investments? 
Um, also in our focus groups, because our survey was limited, the qualitative data that we got from the participants in the focus group was that women found it much easier to have difficult financial conversations, for example, with their own family members, with their children, about their financial needs and constraints. And when they were confronted with financial representatives, found it much more easy to have critical conversations with sales representatives or people who were confronting them with things that they felt about were financially scammy. Right? So they had much more confidence in conducting those conversations and negotiating. What we did find was that there were also very big changes in planning behaviors, although Again, from our qualitative focus groups, we found that women said that when it came to adhering to the concrete specifications of their financial plans, they had difficulty because the financial environment about them changed so quickly. And so even though they might make a plan because the policy environment changed and the financial environment changed, they wouldn't necessarily be able to stick to one specific plan. But in our financial education group, they had the capacity to make nuance. We did see in our group, again, that emerging areas of potential focus for these women were better understanding of CPF and complicated investments, that the specifics of insurance, particularly with the changing insurance market today, was something that they wanted to think about, and estate planning was something that they also wanted to discuss. And that's something that in 2008 was not particularly salient to us in the curriculum. But today, as many older women are actually now caretakers for their own parents, is something that actually has come up again and again, and that the, the needs of the sandwich generation are something that are emerging also in this financial planning landscape. And I'm gonna take you some of these graphs as well, very quickly. What you can see is that, again, the light blue graph, the light blue lines on the graph are our City South Foundation uh, uh, participants and the darker blue are our match comparisons. What you can see here on the left is that our City South Foundation group is much more likely to report having a monthly budget and much less likely to say they don't know <laughs> if they don't have a budget. Again, consonant with what we taught in the program, they are much more likely to keep track of their expenses. And you can see that that gradient is extremely sharp. Here you can see that when we look at the difference between the savings levels, the savings levels here in the group is 95%, which suggests that the level that we observed at the end of the program evaluation in the short term has persisted until today. Our comparison group is actually quite similar, so the differences are not so stark. But what's very stark is the differences on the right-hand side, which is knowing the value of their savings. So women who were not in our program understand that they have some savings, possibly they have some CPF, but they don't know exactly what there is, whereas our participants know. When it comes to emergency savings, clearly our city cell group, again, is much more prepared in terms of having an emergency fund and if they don't have an emergency fund, they're also about 10 percentage points more likely to say that they would be able to access emergency funds. And so they're much more prepared for a financial emergency as well. When we look at debts, this is very interesting. Our city cell group actually is more likely to say, yes, they have some debts, but much less likely to say, I don't know if I have any debts. So it turns out that at the end of the day, even though it turns out that they're more likely to recognize that they have debt, a number of people in the comparison group actually are not very clear of whether or not they have debt outstanding. Some of this we probe is because they are not sure if they don't have conversations with their family members, so they don't know if they themselves are liable. The other reason, which I'll come to very briefly, very shortly, is that our city South participants are more likely to also start businesses. Consistent with our previous result, on the right-hand side, what you can see is that those of those who have debt, our individuals in the city cell program are much more likely to know the exact amount of their debt and liabilities. Whereas in the match comparison group, even though they're much less likely or a little bit less likely to have debt, they are not aware of how much debt they might have or be accumulating. Similarly with investments, what you can see is our city cell group is much more likely to say that they have a good understanding of investments and more likely to say they know the value of their own investments if they have them. And here what you can see is that our city cell group, again, I want to emphasize that this group is matched on age, income and education. So they have the same level of socioeconomic status. They are much more likely to be interested in starting a business or have already started one. And so entrepreneurship levels in this group are much higher. When we look at planning behavior, as I mentioned, there are big differences here as well. Um, our city cell financial education group is more likely, slightly more likely to have an up-to-date will. But actually, again, I believe that if we look at the results here on the, that, that I don't know, 
um, it simply suggests that many of the people in the match comparison group actually just don't know if they have a will or not. And that's the difference. Um, but if we look at the number of them who say that they have a financial plan, I think the results speak for themselves. Our CityStar group is much more likely to have a financial plan. I'm just going to wrap up a little bit by asking the important questions then with all these differences in behavior. What does this mean for actual financial well-being, independence and resilience? Again, this is one of the limitations of our studies that we actually cannot go and get financial information from everyone. So we do rely on self-reported information, but some of these results are very promising. So what we see is that overall, participants report that they have more control and less stress related to financial decisions, so they have better well-being. And we see a couple of indicators about better financial self-sufficiency. And notably, what's interesting is that also that in our survey, they're more likely to have ex increased exposure to financial stresses. So very specifically, the women in our sample are more likely to be asked to be caregivers. And part of that, we hypothesize, and again, is actually borne out by some of our focus group discussions, that because they are better financially prepared, the burden falls on them. And that's something that I think we can explore a little bit more in the, in, the, uh, in the discussion as well, that the women who are more set up and more financially resilient are the ones who end up shouldering also a little bit more of the burden. The good news for us is that they do report being significantly more able to cope with shocks. And I'll just show you a bit of that detail here as well. So what you can see here if, um, is this is, this is the, we asked about a range of financial shocks. Consistent with being more likely to open a business, they were also more likely to report that their business failed or they lost a job, more and more that the business failed. Um, but again, this is accounted for by the fact that more of them actually opened a business. But what you can see on the right-hand side, both in terms of absolute and relative numbers, this is incredibly striking that, the, that in our group of women, almost 40% were asked to take care of an ill or disabled family members compared to 20% in the match comparison group. Again, on an absolute level, that's shocking. And uh, on, an, on a relative level, it suggests to us and again, borne out a little bit by our qualitative uh, uh, research, that when you are financially prepared, the burden of caregiving falls on the woman in the household. We didn't see any significant differences in the loss of spouse or illness of the, of the woman herself, which again suggests to us that there's some causality going on. So this is not just a random shock. What's I think very helpful for us to see is that women in this group were significantly more likely to say that they were able to cope well. So among people who experienced the same shock, what you can see is that the people who had gone through the financial education program were 30%, 30 percent of them said that they coped very well, 47% said that they coped somewhat well. Whereas our match comparison group was more likely to say somewhat well and not very well. And so overall levels of, of coping or ability to cope were much higher in our group. Now, when they look at financial preparation for old age, the feelings of financial, this was not significant, so the distribution was not the same. But again, what's very interesting for us is that the number of women who said that they didn't know they were financially prepared was higher in our comparison group. So we suggest that overall, taking that into account, it does suggest that our women in our financial education group are better prepared. More importantly, if we want to look at the level of well-being among these women, this is a very important indicator which we take from financial capability surveys worldwide. What we find is that the question thinking about or discussing my personal finances can make my heart race or make me feel stressed is a very strong negative indicator of financial security. And what we will see is that in our city South financial education group, this is much reduced. So the level of worry is much less. I want to say a couple of words in the few minutes I have left about COVID-19. Now, um, COVID-19, as we all know, um, has had a huge impact on everyone, including our sample. And what you can see is that in our group, when we ask, have you or any of our main sources of income been financially impacted by COVID-19? Again, what we'll see is that our group here has been much less impacted, partly because they diversify their sources of income. But if we actually look at the income levels, this is a, this is a graph that we did for breaking this down, you'll see that their own income has been sort of, it's actually quite the same. Whereas when we look at the city South group, it looks as if their spouse's income, uh, they're much more likely to report that their spouse's income was impacted relative to the match comparison group, but also a fair number of them also report that their business income was negatively impacted. However, I think, and this is, I think, uh, really sort of a testament to the coping strategies that were introduced by the program. What you can see here, these two graphs are a heat map of coping strategies related to COVID-19. And I'll explain this a little bit. 
Uh, the individuals in dark green are individuals who say financially I am I am coping well and I have sufficient resources. The individuals in red are the ones that say financially I'm not coping well and I don't know what to do. The areas in between are really gradations of I'm I'm coping well because I don't know what to do. I'm coping well because I don't have the resources. And what you can really see is that in our city sao group, many more of the women are coping well or coping somewhat well and actively looking for ways to cope well. Whereas in the comparison group, a larger number of individuals say that they are not coping well because they don't have the necessary resources of support or they don't know what to do. I'm gonna leave us here, this is my last slide. Um, I think overall, both qualitatively and quantitatively, I think this is the slide that we want you to take away from this, is that when we ask women, what did this program do for you? And why do you think that this program should be rolled out for others if you feel that way? And many of them did say or volunteered to us that they felt that this program should be rolled out to others as well. They said, I feel in control of my future when it comes to money matters. What we know is that the world is full of uncertainty. And that if, if we have learned nothing else from the COVID-19 pandemic, that we can't prepare everyone for every little detail. But what our experience with this program shows is that a strong financial education program that is built into the community, a program that sustains itself over time, not because of programmatic resources necessarily, but because of the social networks that take that program up and keep it alive within the community through peer-to-peer -peer communication that is authentic and meaningful can have effects even 10 years down the line. And I said, I was gonna say that this is very striking. And I will tell you that as an academic in this area, we have not seen a financial education program for this group or actually very few other groups that shows this kind of sustained effect 10 years down the line. There are some limitations and caveats to the study, which I'm happy to go to in this graph, primarily that we use only self-reported outcomes Comes. But on the whole, this gives me a lot of hope going forward, both in the nature of the program, but also in the nature of the women who took part. It was a joy to be part of this study, and I'm looking very much forward to the questions. Thank you very much, and I'll pass this back to Susanna. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of uh, data and information. Uh, but as you said, the last uh, slide really uh, is if, if, if anything at all uh, is something that uh, we can hold on to in terms of the impact of the program. Um, and at this point in time, I'd like to call on and introduce the rest of the uh, discussants who will join us uh, in the panel discussion. And uh, I encourage everybody uh, to ask uh, through our Q&A uh, your questions, direct it. Uh, if you want to direct it to uh, uh, specific panelists, please do so. Otherwise, uh, I, I, we can uh, ask whoever is uh, most appropriate to respond. So we have three women uh, who are joining us. And uh, uh, I hope they have had the chance to uh, mull over and reflect on what Joanne has uh, shared just now. So we have uh, Mariam Jafar. Uh, she's a member of parliament for Sembawang GRC. Um, she's also managing director and partner at the Boston Consulting Group uh, here in Singapore. And she's a core leader of the telecommunications, media and technology practice and financial institutions practice. She also leads the initiatives that aim to increase the numbers, success, and satisfaction of women at the firm across Southeast Asia and their women at BCG. Good afternoon, uh, Mariam. Uh, our second panelist uh, is Ginarita Ng. Ginarita Ng Wilan is uh, a mother of three girls and a grandmother of two boys. She's, uh, she joined us, uh, I think the second group of the City South program back in 2007 or eight. Uh, and she signed up uh, in the program after she saw it in uh, one of the newspapers. Uh, and uh, so that's, uh, so it's gonna be interesting to, to hear how uh, her experience and how she has uh, moved on from the program. And our uh, last, but certainly not the least, uh, uh, panelist is Ms. Dawn Sher. And she's a founder of the SG Budget Babe. Uh, and she's Singapore's top female personal finance and lifestyle, lifestyle blogger. And she's been featured on numerous uh, media uh, 
different uh, both uh, print as well as uh, online and uh, and I'm happy to she's joining us uh, this afternoon um let me start by asking uh, the three of you um when john uh, shared the results of uh, the findings uh, maybe we can start with gina gina rita having been one of the alumni um what what came to your mind and what thought what reflection do you have of of the presentation by joanne uh well it was amazing first of all i would like to thank you for inviting me to this webinar mm -hmm. and uh considering about what she said yes i was really surprised that it was yes i received call actually on, on and i didn't realize the result was was amazing that everyone is able to take care and i'm one of them that it belongs to the know how <laughs> and know very well and coping very well because i uh, i would say that uh it was on during my downtime during 2008 so i happened to see this newspaper and then this program actually changed my perceptions and really up to now is uh it is a foundation for me to to handle things even the covid i'm not uh, afraid of it because i'm well prepared for it yeah, this is what I'm doing share. And then, of course, uh, balancing of our life that uh, I'm able to cope emotionally as well. And um, I was lucky that I'm able to have my own house. So I'm actually having my own uh, flat and uh, financially, I'm uh, in a way I'm sound. So coping with this, yes, I do have reserve and I'm also keep on uh, upgrading myself and uh, I'm doing some, I'm attending a course so hopefully I will be able to uh, go into this health um, service society as in a community service. Uh, this I'm constant, constantly wanted to to uh, to be active, to, even though I'm a mother of three and a grandma of two grandchild. So I think that um, women should keep on going. There's no retirement because we are very useful to the community. Yeah, this is what I'm going to share. The sense of uh, the sense of you want to learn, uh, continue to learn, right? Right. Yes. Never uh, ending. Uh, yeah. Thank, thank you, you. Uh, Maria. Do you have any thoughts? Uh, sorry, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I thought it was fascinating, and I think it resonates very well with what I see on the ground um, because the issues you see, uh, you know, when it comes to women who need, especially you know, more mature women um, who need help um, on the ground, there are two issues. One is their financial vulnerability, right? And mm -hmm. it's just uh, whether they are, um, you know, married or or on their own, you know, single, divorced, widowed. Uh, whether they've had a recent illness and they're still stuck with a housing loan, there's a great sense of vulnerability in this population. Um, but that's not the only challenge. I think uh, the other challenge is the lack of knowledge. Um, and there are many levels of this, right? So, um, A, is, and it's not just about the lack of knowledge of financial products, as, uh, as Joanne showed, it's, it's, it's that whole empowerment dimension, right? So, no idea about their family finances. Um, you know, they know what they're given them every month. Mm -hmm. um but uh, and, and they're actually quite good at budgeting within that to be to be honest um um but uh you know i think they you know ask them how much does your husband make or your kid makes most of them you know don't know right uh, and then of course there is uh um just some, as, as we go forward also just a lot of um digital literacy is also a factor right mm -hmm. um even when we were helping people to top up MRSS, right? Not knowing how to mm. go online to make the top ups or not knowing. Um, and, you know, you can't pay cash at CPF anymore, right? So yeah, yeah. people kept giving us cash. Uh, can you do my top up for me? I said, no, you know, um, but we can help you to to actually, um, you know, set up your pay now. And, but it's, not, it's, it's hard to get people to trust all that. Um, so we do need to make sure that the schemes, I think, you know, I think the knowledge is great. That I, I don't want to underemphasize the things that you need to know to actually act on your knowledge, right? Um, and in terms of, uh, you know, having the right tools, being able to go to the right websites and things like that. So, so I think uh, I wouldn't say surprising because it resonates, um, but certainly, uh, you know, it's great to see that uh, data quantified. Thank you, Don. 
Yeah, I think the results were actually really interesting. Um, and it's really nice to see that the program has had impact on women. I think that definitely it's so true um, that a lot of the financial burden does fall on the women, but they're sometimes the most ill-equipped to deal with all these different financial decisions or they may have been too bogged down by taking care of the family life that they haven't had the chance to go and learn and equip themselves with all these skills. So seeing how this is actually manifested in the way they approach their money, the way they have actually changed their attitudes towards finances, that's been really good. Um, I think the only thing I wish was that more women and that this program could be extended to a lot more people because um, it is definitely a gap in society that we're starting to see very strongly. And with more resources being done, whether at a national level or even by private trusts and foundations or schools, we definitely cannot neglect um, educating the women in this aspect. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to, uh, before I... Uh, uh, get some of the questions. Uh, we have uh, six questions now on the q and um, I'd like to kind of ask uh, the panel um, about financial resilience, uh, which is really, uh, I mean, uh, back uh, when we started the program, uh, we didn't realize that there will be a global financial crisis uh, the year after. Uh, and that uh, actually um, was, was uh, as a result, we had more women sign up as a result because they wanted to really learn. And interestingly, uh, Generita and Dawn, uh, during the financial global financial crisis in 2008, both of you, uh, I didn't know this until I had a chance to talk to both of you, that you were actually both impacted uh, by the global financial crisis. Um, could you share a little bit about whatever you're comfortable to share uh, in terms of that experience, but more importantly, how did you uh, cope with that uh, impact as well as uh, what could you learn and what can we learn from your experience? Uh, uh, and now that we are in a global pandemic and we know that uh, it, it, it may not just be this year or next year, a few years, we would still need to really understand how we can cope better. So I think uh, your experiences uh, at different stages of your life, uh, you were very young, uh, uh, Dawn and uh, Generita, you um, different life stages, but, but the impact was actually something I think powerful enough for, for us to learn from. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you choose whoever wants to share first. Uh, yeah, I, I can go first. Um, so I think for me, uh, the Asian financial crisis hit my family pretty badly. So we were middle income. And while growing up, um, what actually happened was that my dad, thankfully, was employed uh, by, it, he was a civil servant, so he was protected. Um, but my mom was working in the private sector and she actually got retrenched. Um, I'm not sure, I think some of the panelists here might remember that back in those years, um, we had very big manufacturing companies in Singapore. And during that Asian financial crisis, a lot of them were in the news for cutting huge number of their workers because of the whole um, financial crisis. So my mom got affected and the problem is that I think most people don't realize when you lose your income and if it's the only source of income that you're relying on, it actually causes a lot of cash flow issues because your expenses don't just disappear overnight. Right, your liabilities are still there, your mortgages. And in our case, my mom still had to pay for all of the different groceries, our education fees, tuition, so on and so forth. So what she did, and I watched her go about doing it, was actually borrowing and taking on a lot of debt. And what I actually learned and that cemented my decision is that, you know, it's actually really dangerous to rely on just one source of income. And I think last year when COVID hit, we have been seeing that come out a lot stronger. So two key things have always been talking and telling women, not just women, but basically everyone to do is that you need to make sure you have an emergency fund. Right, but people usually underestimate the importance of it. They always think like, oh no, like saving for a rainy day is something that's outdated. I don't think anything bad will happen because nothing bad has happened so far. So they underestimate it, but it will come in handy at times like this. And the other thing is when people are relying only on one sole source of income, 
or or maybe relying on their partner's source of income, it can actually be really dangerous for the family because you're going to run into cash flow issues, which will then lead to a lot of emotional and mental turmoil. So that actually really made my parents' marriage pretty rocky. Um, and it affected the whole relationship, how they approached things later on. Um, so when I, you know, when when it how it affected me was that I was pretty sheltered because I was a kid, but seeing all these really made me realize that hey, you know, when I'm older, when I grow up, I want to make sure that I'm never held ransom by just my employer or one source of income. And I think the beauty of it today is that um, COVID has also accelerated the, the digital revolution. And today, anyone can be an entrepreneur if you want to. So you can set up a small business. I was just reading about this elderly lady who is selling home bakeries, right? Um, home bake stuff to raise funds for her household expenses. You can be a home baker. Maybe you're good at sewing and some people were like selling handmade masks during the pandemic last year. So there are many ways that you can reach out, you build your own audience and you start a simple e-commerce business without having to commit huge amount of money or rental or huge warehousing supplies upfront. This is a huge change from the past. And I think this is definitely something that we should learn from. Women can actually realize that whether or not, they, if they have zero sources of income, then start building um, the first one. And then the second and the next. And it doesn't have to be so huge. It can, because many small sources of income can actually give you that financial stability. But if you find that one of them is your niche, is your strength, then you can choose to explore that and go deeper into it to make it an even bigger business for yourself. So that's where specialization versus generalization can come to key. And I think that's one great way that we can all learn, whether it's from the Asian financial crisis that my parents were hit by or the global financial crisis if people were affected by that or even last year's crisis i think that the learning points are generally pretty much the same when it comes to financial management okay i'll listen to gina's story what about you gina yes well it's uh well i listen to you i'm actually very happy to hear that when you're talking about this uh kind of bakery thing the business in the true internet I'm also thinking of this. Okay, before I begin with this, uh, I would like to share about my, uh, my uh, back in 2008, my situation was that um, I was kind of like, I was a housewife for many years. So what happened is that my, um, my ex-husband has got financial uh, difficulties. He failed his uh, business. So everything has really uh, impacted me a lot. So I have to start thinking of what should I do? Um, and of course, because of he left the car, he left Singapore actually for a certain kind of business opportunity in China. So I have to take care of the family. So what I have to do is not to cry and that's it, but I have to make sure that I have to move on because this is my responsibility to raise my kids. So I go in different types of uh, channel that I have to start looking for job. And I also do some kind of part time as a coach you know, in Tai Chi. And uh, I realized through this uh, program, I changed my perceptions because that we are very tra traditional, that we think mm -hmm. that we it is our responsibility, we have to take care of them, even though what kind of things happen financially, by, be it we have to raise our kids with our own ability, without them burdened with the financial problem. But I understand that, oh, actually we need to uh, save ourselves in a way that we have to be strong, stand mm -hmm. up, and then we can help our kids. And I understand that in this case, because I was a housewife, so I have to do some kind of thinking. So in other words, that uh, my kids, they're all grown up and they actually are uh, U-grades and they actually uh, have this, um, I think it's a kind of bank, uh, which means they borrow from bank, which means that student loans, true students mm -hmm. loan, they work through it. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, I'm very happy that they are able to take uh, to take care of themselves because I first of all I have to change my mindset otherwise I'm very emotionally affected because oh you know I'm very worthless not to be able to help them up so with that I went through and I got a job so these kind of things that of course you know financial financially I have to start saving that's why I got my house and I'm able to live by my own with my daughter so uh, this is what I experienced and uh, yes you're right uh, right now we are facing the COVID and this actually have a strong foundation for me that we can walk through 
without any single problem, you know, financially as well as emotionally, because we are well prepared for that. And I hope that, you know, everyone can go through if there's any program again no, to, to, to let them know so they can actually walk through uh, and then able to help themselves. So yeah, this is what my sharing is. Yeah, yeah. thank you for both of you for sharing. And uh, I think for, for me, the important thing is really uh, a crisis uh, gives you the chance to, uh, to really practice to a certain extent what you have learned uh, from financial education and builds up your confidence in terms of uh, uh, how do you uh, overcome and how do you cope uh, in, in a situation. And I like, uh, I'm encouraged by what Generita has said and, and Don to a certain extent alluded to is that because you are both uh, financially uh, literate in that sense, financial savvy, you may, you, you feel more confident that yes, we are in a crisis again, but because that confidence gives you the a certain edge to be able to look at it uh, and then really uh, ha uh, face on uh, kind of like uh, really face it uh, in, in that sense. You're, you're not scared of, of the impact and uh, you're able to navigate uh, what are the resources. And one of the questions actually from the floor is around what are the resources uh, for, 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 for those with the pandemic? And I know that uh, Actually, you could go online on the Money Sense. There's a very specific uh, uh, website uh, 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 portion in the Money Sense website around what are the uh, support, financial support, and the different schemes uh, for those that are affected by COVID-19. So, for for the person who's asking, um, we can provide the the website for that. There's a Money Sense uh, a website on that. Um, I'll kind of shift a little bit the gear and ask Mariam. Um, the minister has uh, has presented and shared with us the, about the match retirement saving scheme. I think I, I'm not too sure if Generita has joined the when we piloted it uh, the match uh, match saving scheme a few years ago. Uh, so now it's being implemented this year, and this you year. have you have had a chance to. Uh, to walk around and, and, and really try and encourage your constituents to understand it. Um, what, what's your experience uh, so far in terms of engaging them and understanding what are the barriers for them to be able to access? What's the, the bus uh, around the much retirement savings scheme? Yeah. The foundation certainly believes in this as a scheme. So <laughs> you want to encourage more, more yeah. uh, people? No, to I think, first of all, I think that, uh, you know, part of my job, I think, is to help people to navigate schemes, right? As an MP. Yes, yes. Um, and I actually think when I saw this scheme, I said, this is really fantastic because uh, for a number of reasons, I think it's not just that. Uh, um, it gets people to, not just that it helps to build their, their um, retirement accounts of, you know, the target group, uh, in this case, many women and, uh, and the lower income. Um, in a way, you know, many times I've, I've always felt like the more well-off actually benefit more from a lot of the existing CPS schemes, you know, like tax rebates and stuff. You're not paying taxes, you don't really care, right? So, so this one is a scheme that's really targeted, uh, gives a lot of bang for the buck because, you know, it's also the same group that's getting 6% interest um, on, at least on their first 30 or 60,000. Um, and it's sustained over five years, which I think is critical to build the habit uh, and to build the time for understanding uh, and, and, and awareness. And because of the target group is not, for many of them, they actually are, you know, we can pitch that uh, you'll get the money, you'll get some of the money soon anyway. So you still have a bit of that, you know, the, the gratification is not too far away. You're not asking mm -hmm. people to put in money for 20, 30, 40 years from now. Right, so so I think it's a great scheme uh, and which was what prompted us not just to, you know, talk to people about it um, when 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 they ask or, uh, but to actually have um, you know a dedicated program for it. Um, so we had three different sessions in English, Chinese, um, and Malay, um, to basically where we also had CPF um, come, um, as well as a financial speaker who could speak in less jargon than CPF. Right? <laughs> so and in their and 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 uh, in in their language. Um, to, to talk about you know their own person their own experiences and their takeaways 
Um, and uh, following that, have a session where um, you know, the, the residents could come one on one and you know consult us about okay, so if I put in the money in this, when do I actually get it out? You know, how much more do I get a month? You know, that that sort of thing. Um, and I think a big part of the challenge that I see is that uh, you know, especially for um, the the housewives that um, there's not a lot of awareness right mm. so they don't understand what cp they've never really had cpf so you know it's not top of mind for them um and unless somebody tells them to do it they are if their kids say let's take a look at this so if their spouses say that very few will will you know look at a scheme and say hey um look at a scheme that's announced and register that it could actually help them so you have to, you know, consciously bring people in and, and explain it. And, you know, there is still some skepticism about when I can get my money out and stuff like that. So you have to, you have to overcome those, you know, mental barriers against CPF. I always tell people it's like a Maslow's pyramid, right? Your base retirement should always be CPF, right? You can do, once you have, you know, your base, you can do anything you want uh, with your money, but but uh, CPF is a great and efficient scheme um, uh, to, to, to set up that base. So so I think the, the, the challenges are A, awareness, um, B, even when they're aware, how to actually get them to do something about it. Um, so, and then I think also, you know, you tell somebody, to top up 600 if, if they only hear oh i top up 600 dollars and then the government will give me 600 um most of them will say that oh i don't have that 600 right mm -hmm. so it's how to explain to them that you don't have to put it in all at once you can do it mm -hmm. you know 50 dollars a month is 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 is, uh, is 600 dollars for a year mm -hmm. so how do you actually just make it very easy for them to do small things right mm -hmm. um and it's uh, and and I think that the real power is over these five years, if they can see every year how the money accumulates, and I mean the most basic thing people have to learn is not about which bond to buy or it, it is to understand the power of compounding, mm -hmm. um, and that I think is the 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 message that we try and uh, um, you know get across in in the sessions and then we you know for people who need extra help to to actually make those contributions we do that too right the then the, the i think then as i said before you know even once you've got them uh on board you've got to make it very easy for them to to uh to actually make those top ups um not all of them are, are tech savvy so we actually had our digital ambassadors come in to the session also and uh, help them set up pay now accounts and uh, and teach them how to do the, the top-ups um, on the same day. Um, or those who were still not comfortable, you know, got them appointments at CPF for it to, where someone would be waiting for them to help them use the AXS machine. So I think you it, it needs to be a fairly handheld process and, mm -hmm. and they have to, it, it's not cool to say that I'm going to put money into CPF, you know. So they have to uh, uh, feel like, I mean, we made a whole video, a funny video for it. Um, and, yeah. So uh, in a way, yeah. uh, so in a way, uh, because as you said, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the awareness may be there, but there's uh, an issue of the trust and how, yes. what would it really be enough? Uh, uh, and I think uh, to a certain extent, you the, uh, uh, really for us, uh, that's why we've, we've uh, done uh, the financial education program, precisely because of this, you know, how do you build the trust? Uh, uh, by by engaging them uh, on a continuing basis uh, and then kind of like uh, breaking down the big yes. concepts into something that's understandable to them. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so just thank you for 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 your uh, thoughts yeah. on that. I'll share one more thing, which was I thought was really cool. Um, you know, during we saw a lot of people doing it. Um, once they got it, that they were gonna get you know three thousand dollars over five years, it was going to go to X, and they they may not have felt like they had the money but then you know a lot of these um some of them are also beneficiaries of uh, the silver support scheme mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um which you know you, of course you get um, now an increase some when quarterly mm -hmm. when you uh, um when you uh, turn 65 right so um you know when some when a few people said oh okay um i 
I'm going to get my silver support payment soon. So you mean I can put in like $300 here? And then, yeah, then, and, then know, and so it's like using different government schemes to fund more ways of getting more money for yourself, right? So it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, that was very gratifying. I was like, yes, Pachi, that's the way. You know? <laughs> yes, you can do that. Yeah, <laughs> there's a very interesting question here, which I hope Dawn can help us. Uh, how to kickstart the discussions about financial independence with your spouses if uh, the husband has always been the one to manage the family income and expenses? I think um, you have to take small steps at a time. So um, we can start by showing more of an interest in helping the husband with some of the bills, for example, because I'm pretty sure no one's going to reject if you offer to help manage that. <laughs> my, I would be certainly very pleased if my husband helped um, so it's the other way around my household. So having those small discussions first to take an interest in financial matters. And then after that, it'll be easier for you to build up to a larger conversation with your spouse on, hey, actually looking at where our bills are or what we've been spending on for the past few weeks or months, um, I just started thinking maybe we should start planning for our future. How will our retirement funding look like? What about for our kids? And then it'll be easier to go into these bigger topics rather than, you know, your spouse has always been taking care and then you just say, hey, uh, let's sit down and have a conversation about our finances. And the spouse might potentially get offended. They might be like, wait, why? I've always been in charge is it because you don't trust me but when you start to take an interest right then people like both of you guys are working hand in hand so that's definitely it's going to make it easier for you to have that conversation up front thank you thank you that uh, helps a lot uh, hopefully um, there's a question here um, Joanne aside from uh, the MRSS uh, is there anything that has worked elsewhere to help uh, uh, financial resilience, uh, especially among women. That uh, in Singapore context, we can consider. And uh, actually, one of the things I wanted to ask uh, Mariam, but uh, maybe later she can ask, is, uh, you know, the MRSS, uh, within five years, it's being implemented. Uh, uh, one of my advocacy that uh, could involve Joan is, I hope the government uh, would, uh, would consider uh, doing some evaluation around it in after five years, no, Joanne? <laughs> Are there any other schemes or programs, uh, policy elsewhere, Joanne? Um, well, I would say that a lot of the policies that we've seen elsewhere are very specific to the systems that they have. So we have schemes elsewhere where we have very much uh, different universal pension systems, for example. Mm -hmm. um, we have schemes that have much uh, stronger sort of uh, efforts to keep women in the workplace for longer. And we have schemes that pay, for example, women or put in uh, contributions to people's retirement savings based on caregiving, for mm -hmm. example. These are very new. But all of them have trade-offs as well. Because at the end of the day, uh, retirement security is expensive and some of these schemes that work for individuals don't often work for the country. So I would say that um, stepping back, what we're seeing is that it really is uh, um, a, like financial education cannot be the only pillar. Mm -hmm. right? One of the things I want to mention about the program here is that we don't want something like this to be the victim of its own success. What mm -hmm. we are seeing is that it is successful in changing women's behavior, but there is still a long way to go from that knowledge and behavior change to financial outcomes. Yes. And I think as uh, Dawn, Gina, Rita, and Mariam have all emphasized, you it's very difficult to catch people up um, in a day or through an online session or mm -hmm. through a workbook, right? With the experience of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And it's very that's very, very challenging to do. So I want to say that if we look at the baseline levels and the financial levels, mm -hmm. even at the end of the program, there's still mm -hmm. a gap that has to be filled by public policy, by schemes like the MRSS, to come in and fill that gap. There has to be consumer protection, pension protection, and there have to be, I think, you know, awareness. I want to again stress um, very, very strongly that the compound interest is our best friend. So one of the things I think that works best for older women are schemes that address younger women and getting younger women to save, be proactive, start those conversations in a constructive way at the beginning of a relationship before they get married to have those conversations up front, even when they're not salient mm -hmm. in our everyday life. It's not something that, that couples naturally want to think about or even discuss in the, you know, when, uh, when, they're, when they're going through it. But 
the life cycle of uh, the life cycle theorem and everything is very theoretical, but the practical nature of this is that we have to start young and there's a lot of catch up that we have to do otherwise. We, we need to start young. <laughs> yes, indeed. So uh, one, but one of the things that uh, starting young is that uh, the knowledge uh, is something that could be easily uh, provided uh, even in the uh, educational system. And we know that uh, internationally, there's effort to monitor that uh, knowledge, financial literacy among the young. Uh, but it's the, also the confidence level, right, uh, Joanne, that, uh, that's quite important in terms of the behavior change. Uh, you may have the knowledge, the awareness, as Mariam has said, of a scheme, but the confidence that do I trust this? Is this something for me? Is it really going to work for me? I think that's also a, a bit of a, a bit of a, uh, an indicator or something that needs to be looked at uh, in terms of uh, how do you change people's behavior from knowledge to action. Yeah. Uh, so part of what we know with behavior change is that when you have knowledge, one of the really important things that has to happen is self-efficacy. You have to believe that if you act on that knowledge, you will see a change in outcomes. If you don't have that belief because you think your abilities are not high or you think the environment is too overwhelming, then you won't undertake that behavior change, mm -hmm. right? And so building that confidence is really important. Some of it is going to come from teaching better in schools. And I will tell you, okay, economics teachers, we have done a terrible job. We have turned generations of people away from economics because they are so bored by us. But as a matter of fact, those foundations are important. But I think the other really important thing which we saw in our program, and actually we've really demonstrated so beautifully here today is that we can learn from the experience of other people. And mm -hmm. the experience of seeing the results manifest, as Mariam also has mentioned, right? Showing people very clearly the effects of their actions, that small actions can lead to outcomes and change to build that confidence. Hearing the narratives of other people that are relatable, like Dawn and Gina Rita, to see that actually behavior can lead to outcomes. Actually, it's, I think all of these are great ways to build confidence in women and also in men as well. Let's not leave the poor men out of this. <laughs> yes, definitely. The man has to get it as well because it, it's a uh, right, uh, Don Mariam, yeah, <laughs> Gina Rita. Otherwise, uh, at some point, it becomes an issue. Uh, when, when, uh, um, yeah. So I think um, let me. Uh, we're almost uh, running out of time. Uh, let me kind of like try and see. Uh, are there any other questions that uh, we can answer right now? For those who have answered, uh, asked questions and we have not had a chance to, to answer, we will definitely um, get back to you and send you by email uh, answers to your questions, especially those questions that involve providing you with some information, how to start a business after retirement, because that means uh, uh, we may need to find uh, resources uh, 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 online and uh, elsewhere to be able to respond to that. Uh, there's also a question about how do you start a family session around financial? <laughs> you know, uh, th this means it's not just about the husband and the wife. It involves the children. Um, and 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 how, how do you? Joanna said uh, alluded to. We need to start young. You know, um, is this something that uh, we <coughs> embrace and can start really encouraging family at the family level? Um, to have that uh, discussion around uh, finance. Uh, Dawn and Gina, uh, at what age did you start talking about finance to your, with your children? I know Dawn is uh, still very young probably, but Gina Rita, after, after, uh, after the program, did you discuss with your daughters uh, uh, about okay, finances? Because and they require to take a loan. Mm -hmm. So actually my daughters, my, my it actually started from my eldest daughter. So subsequently, the three daughters, which means three of them are having this student loan. So they do discuss and do understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, right now, uh, my youngest kid, which is the, um, the youngest daughter, she maybe is because throughout my experience and because she experienced when she was young, what, what happened throughout the crisis. So she also, uh, uh, she's aware of how to actually save up. She also mm -hmm. have... Um, 
she has also taken care of the insurance policy. Mm. Um, well, she's still paying the loan because um, that is like she graduated not long ago, a uh, few years. So, so mm -hmm. she's uh, she's get taking care of herself very well. So she understands how to save some, as in like uh, do some. Uh, uh, I'm sure she has their own financial uh, kind of plan. But uh, what I understand that she is very well aware how to um, take care of the insurance in case anything. It can be a saving. Uh, it can be a, a kind of life uh, assurance. Uh, so in my uh, my in my case that I'm very happy that at least that three kids they are able to take care of their financial plan for the rainy days because uh, the yeah this is what I want to share. Thank yeah. you, Don. At what age uh, are you planning to start with your kids? <laughs> yeah, I think planning is the better question. Um, my my son is um two plus now and my next baby is gonna be out only in the next few months right but i think yes. um i feel like the best time is to really get them started when they're in primary school because you know like um i, I actually my plan right is gonna be a bit earlier so i intend to kind of experiment with my kids in that sense whereby when they're in kindergarten and they understand how to count right now my son is learning how to count so i'm gonna act actively involve him in trips to the grocery supermarket and then get him to like he's already starting to pay for some of the stuff with my card but I think he just thinks it's magic money at the time <laughs> so I need him to understand there's actually real money and probably you know convert some to cash and let him count and feel mm -hmm. that and then like you know get him involved in those daily um task of paying these bills so he kind of gets the concept and then when he goes to primary school that's when a primary one that uh they get the pocket money to spend at recess time right i think that's a great start and i hope i can be harsh in the sense that i'm gonna say um here's x dollars this week if you spend it all i'm sorry go hungry <laughs> because like that's what my parents did to me and okay. and even though like it was harsh love but i felt like it really taught me the importance of look if i run out that's it so all my that's life I was always very careful about budgeting because I knew like I cannot rely on anyone to pack me up if I run out of money. Yeah, so I'm going to do that for myself. But actually, I'm also really keen to hear from, from the rest of you guys because um, for, especially for those whose children are older, what would be a better age that you started and was that effective? Or am I like, you know, am I starting too young? <laughs> no, I agree with you. Uh, sorry. Um, yes, yes, I just started with them quite young. So just mm -hmm. like what you did. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just that because of crisis, they are more aware of how to take care of their finances. Yes, mm. yes, yes, yes. So really yeah. starting here. Yeah. yeah, Maria? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, you know, you should start young. And look, I think I maybe not Dawn, but uh, I, I always remember how um, how I got started, which was, you know, the little squirrel saver uh, stickers, right? So POSB had this <laughs> little booklets and that's just something different when you go and actually buy a stamp and put it on, you just feel like this sense of accomplishment of putting, a, <laughs> of building your tree, right? Of, of, of stamps, it's really silly and then bring it to the bank, you feel very good. But I, I actually think, you know, that young part is, is, is the easier part. Um, because uh, it, it's actually how do you make sure that those conversations don't shift as, as you get older and start to embed some stereotypes that, um, mm -hmm. that uh, you know, I think are important for us to kind of challenge if we are going to have... Um, long-term gender equity um, requires economic equity, right? So mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's, to me, what's more dangerous is the moments when, when um, girls are in university or, um, you know, choosing what to do or choosing to get married and what their parents tell them to do, uh, what their fathers encourage them to do in terms of uh, how to think about their own in financial independence and um, their own, uh, you know, the choice of careers that they should be, I guess, looking to, to do and not be limited um, yes, yes. and not to feel like you should be dependent on some guy at any point in time, right? Yeah. So, because I actually think at the, at the young, uh, there's very there's less distinction between um, boys and girls, right? We all yeah. like to say, mm -hmm. but it's actually when we start when the social elements start kicking in later, that's where I think the danger spots is. And I think actually 
to me, probably the question that the panelists had in mind was uh, that, that was asked is really even beyond that, right? So when you're already married and you haven't been taken, uh, you know, you've not been having those conversations. Yes. How do you start, mm. you know? Um, and I've, I mean, MR says it's a very, very late, so it's far too late, but actually that schemes like that help us to, hey, actually, you know, I should have my own CPF account. And by the way, I get more interest than you, you know, because yes. I have no money. You know, yes. I get 6%, you get 4%. So maybe we have extra money, we should put it in mine rather than yours. Right? That, yes. that kind of, uh, yeah. that kind of um, um, conversation, conversation needs to start happening. Yeah. Sometimes it needs, yeah. it needs somebody to help. And, yeah. and this kind of schemes can actually just trigger that uh, open conversation. You know? I, I had yeah. several of those with couples when we came to, when we did the MRSS talks, you know, I said, yeah. if and you put it in your account, you'll get 4%, you know, you get yeah. nothing. So, you know, so it's a... That's actually true. Uh, we can, uh, uh, you know, educate, uh, provide the knowledge and the habit of savings and uh, uh, create the awareness about the importance of money and being reliant on yourself early on. But uh, we know from data in Singapore that uh, there's a critical stage uh, when women reach uh, around 30 to 35 or less than 40, the social dimension of the expectation around uh, being a caregiver, giving up work, you know, and, and taking care of the children. And that results uh, to some of the women actually making choices that impacts their financial ability to take care of themselves in old age. They get out of the labor force and they don't come back, even the most educated. So yeah. yes, so in a way, our uh, one of the things that we are saying is that we really need to look at the life stages of women and at which point and what kind of financial knowledge is most appropriate to build up that uh, resilience at some point. And to go back to our, uh, I mean, you know, uh, as you all know, South Foundation is really about how to support both men and women to age uh, independently and financially independent and financial security, that sense of financial security. And as, as a last, just, just to allow each and every one of you to, to give us uh, one minute or two minutes of your thoughts about I mean, we will be living longer as women, and that's for sure is a fact, uh, you know. And and uh, as as we realize now, as as Joanna's mentioned, that uh, a financial education program can help us to to build some of those behaviors that are sustained, sustainable, and can be sustained. And we have seen in Jean, Jean Rita that uh, she is still uh, practicing those. Uh, do we? Do you see yourself uh, uh, in, in? Have you started to think about that uh, you'll be in your eighties and nineties? As uh, uh, you may be, we may all be very different here because we we may be more financially aware and financially literate. But what can we give as as a tip, as a, as as a guidance to other women who may not have started to think about that they will actually be living longer, even beyond ninety? That's uh, for sure is something that, and there will be more of us. We are looking at uh, 2030, there will be more older persons in Singapore. How to ensure that each and every one of us, each and every one of those who will be in that, uh, in that uh, one out of five, 65 years old, how to enjoy the longer years uh, that they will be surely be having at some point. Yeah, so whoever starts, and I know the time is uh, running out. Uh, maybe, uh, Maria, do you want to start? So if I understand the question, how to tell women that they're going to live very long? <laughs> have, have you, yeah, and have you, uh, like, say when you go around uh, your constituency, yeah. uh, the MRSS, uh, are they looking at it as a short term? within five years or are they linking it up to the fact that they actually need to need that savings because they are going to be living longer yeah so i i i think it's that's a mix i think for some it, it triggers that uh, that understanding um but you know when we talk about mrss we don't just talk about mrss we also talk <laughs> about like i said before the silver support and and then of course the other scheme is the cpf life right um and it just 
I think when they find out about one scheme, you have a better chance of them finding out about. So whatever it is that catches their attention um, is important, right? Because yeah. then maybe they'll start talking to a financial consultant, um, you know, listening to other schemes. And one of the, and of course, CPM life pays you forever. Right? Yeah. And I always tell them that, uh, look, and it's true, we're all going to live until we're like 120, I think, <laughs> at least people in my generation, because uh, medical advances are that way, right? So uh, I think the, for, for the young, the biggest challenge is, um, it's not a challenge, it's okay, but you know, you can be YOLO, but please have that base first. <laughs> you know? The important the, to have that base. Uh, yeah, thank you, Joanne. Do you have uh, some final thoughts? Uh, yeah, no, I would say that that's, uh, that that's great advice that you can lo YOLO, but things should get started soon. I think one of the things that we want to know and we want to understand is that that uh, the behavioral science behind this is really important. That sometimes when women feel they can't achieve the goal, they think it's too late for me. And I would say that it's never too late for you. Getting started late is better than getting started never. And yes. again, you know, Planning, some people say, well, the world is so complex today, why should I plan? In fact, some planning is going to be better than no planning. At that's the true. end of the day, there's something that we can all do. And I think, you know, changing the narrative from something that's very negative to something that is positive. I think yes. the fact that we have couples that come and instead of it being a source of tension now become a source of sort of mutual engagement and excitement about what they can do and how much they can get. It may not seem like a very big step, but it is a big step because it changes the orientation. It changes the, the, the conversation. Something is better than nothing. And when we want to educate people, I'll tell you what's the worst financial education program. It's the one that's perfect and nobody goes to. All right, that yeah. is a useless financial education program. So I would much rather that we have this continuing conversations that are very dynamic, but actually reach people on the ground and mm -hmm. are effective in this way to help them get started wherever they are and meet them wherever they are. Thank you, Gina and Don. Very, very short. <laughs> Perhaps any last uh, thoughts? Uh... Well, okay, for me, as in like the world is changing. So we have to go along to, with the world. And uh, based on my age, right, in another 30 years, uh, there's quite some time in the future. But I would say that we have to live at the present moment. So in more, in the most importantly is that your mindset, your perceptions. So uh, as a human being, I think that we can make use of our ability, whatever we can, just to service community, regardless of your age. <laughs> so of course with this age that uh, I have these foundations it helps me a lot so um, to out there the people if they can attend this course so they will change their perceptions they will be able to handle and uh, they see the world differently even the COVID because it's not the external situation it's very much with your internal situation once you change your perceptions you're able to have a clarity and awareness are there so you are able to handle things well Thank you. And Don? Um, I would say just have confidence. Um, I think for the longest time, we always left it to the men. And the investing world, the financial world is all dominated by males. But it's increasingly a female-dominated society as well. I mean, we already see lots more females being represented in parliament and also having more females in the workforce, leading the household. So have faith and go out there to find the resources. I think generally, there are a lot of useful resources um, today. In fact, we're a lot luckier now because there's so much information resources. I try to contribute to that space by writing a lot on what I know okay. and running through like you know personal finance 101 covering things like CPF how to reduce your income taxes it's a good thing the ministers are, are not listening to this but um and all of the different stuff right how to maximize all your gains and all but I think more importantly it's like what you guys have mentioned it's about recognizing that need to learn and then embracing it and going out there to get the resources for yourself because we can run the best program out there and you can have all the best resources out there. But if people don't care, people are not bothering to get educated, then that gap will continue to exist. So when you start early, um, if you're worried about your retirement or your parents' retirement, or you're just concerned about potentially not being able to meet your short-term or mid-term goals, you can always start now. And starting today is always better than not doing anything at all. 
Thank you so much, Don. Uh, and and with that, I'd like to thank the uh, the four of you, uh, Don, uh, Mariam, Joanne, and Gina Rita, for for um, joining me in the, today's webinar and for the panel discussion. So um, we are coming to a close now. I'd like to thank uh, our again our all of you, the guests. Uh, the participants who are still here and all the questions, uh, we will answer them uh, separately. Um, and really, we would like to thank Joanne for, for uh, her presentation and uh, all the, uh, the panelists' reflections and sharing. Uh, I also want to thank um, the team, my team and the Aging Asia Alliance team for, for all the help that they have done today. And do please um, uh, leave us a feedback.